Well, good evening, Rocky Peak. Great to see you. My name's Michael, and I'm one of the pastors here. If it's your very first time, I want to welcome you. I'm uh, excited to have you here. We're going to go into our time of teaching right now. And so inside your program is a green and white message note sheet we use every week. But if you're new, you may not know that. So you want to pull that out. That'll help you follow along. And if you guys are ready to go, I'm ready to jump in. You guys ready to go? Yeah. Okay, let's pray. God, we're just excited to be here in your presence. And what an amazing time of worship tonight and just uh, experiencing your, your movement here and the way you speak and the way you, you guide. Lord, I just have great anticipation for this whole weekend and what you're going to be doing as we come under your leadership as a church, take communion later on as we listen and follow what you're saying to us in this important area of forgiveness. It's just so critical. So we pray, God, that you would be speaking, breaking down any barriers that we have in our mind. You would be tearing down any strongholds of the enemy that hold up, that oppose the work of King Jesus in our life. You would tear those down, that we could move into the future and the freedom that you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, our story starts today on a Thursday night, and uh, she's been away all week on business. Um, she had to fly to the East Coast for a whole week of uh, important meetings for a company. But uh, crazy, it never happens this way. But this particular week, they ended early. They accomplished what they needed to do Thursday morning. And so she decides, hey, if I jump on a flight, I can fly home a day early and surprise my husband. And so she does. And so she's so excited about this. And so she gets into the airport and she jumps in her car and she's just looking forward to it. She, she makes the long trip, uh, trip home, pulls in the driveway. His car's there so she knows he's home. And it's about 8 o'clock at night, just a little bit late, but she's hoping that they'll be able to go out to dinner, maybe have a glass of wine together, just catch up on what's going on from being away. And uh, so she walks up the steps into her, up their porch. She puts her key in the door and slowly turns it, trying to keep as quiet as possible. When she comes in, the room is dimly lit, and it's extremely quiet. And she begins to wonder uh, like what's going on, and she remembers that he's just been working so hard the last couple of months, a lot of late nights, and she's wondering if he just came home and crashed. And so she begins to walk down the, the hallway towards their bedroom, the door's closed, and when she gets there, as quietly as she can, she reaches for the, 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 the doorknob and begins to turn it uh, in case he gets asleep, that she won't wake him. And as she begins to open the door, there's sort of a soft glow coming from the room. Uh. Well, today, we are continuing this journey that we've been on for the last seven weeks uh, called Loving People, Doing Relationships a Whole New Way. And uh, for those of you who are new, a special welcome to you, but also just a quick uh, recap where we've been in this series. This is a series about relationships. And what we've seen is that when a man or woman comes to Jesus, he's very clear. If you've not yet come to Jesus, that when you come under his leadership of King Jesus, top two priorities are our lives. We would love God with everything we have. That to know him, to love him, to please him is our top priority in life. And then out of that flows the second priority that we learn to love others as we love ourselves, that we learn to love others as he has loved us. And yet, what we've seen in this series is that often we come to Jesus with this new love for God, new love for one another or for others that have been birthed in our heart by the Holy Spirit. And yet often we're not sure how to live out that life of love in everyday life. So often, we often uh, kind of when it comes to our relationships, we tend to kind of fall back on our old patterns, our old habits, our old models that are often highly dysfunctional, even destructive. And so what we're learning in this series is how to, how to go back to the Word and say, what does it look like to really live out this new life of love, to do relationships a whole new way, the Jesus way. And today, topic on the table is forgiveness. And obviously, if, if we're going to live a life of love and do relationships a whole new way, it's one of the most important topics in this series. And so what I'm going to be doing today is I want to highlight, start by just quickly going over seven big picture principles about forgiveness, what it is, what it isn't, how it works, why it's so important. And then we're going to come back at the end and get as practical as we can 
focus on three steps we can take to grow in this area of forgiveness in our own lives. And so there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called Forgiveness, the Path to Freedom. We'll be moving through pretty rapidly. I think that by about midnight, we should be done. <laughs> you, can, you can see there's hardly any place to take notes uh, today. Number one, uh, first principle, big picture principle is that forgiveness is vital. In other words, if we want to live a life of love, if we want to learn how to do relationships a whole new way, if we want to love others as Jesus has loved us, that forgiveness is absolutely vital. And one of the, if you were here last week, the topic on the table was conflict. And what we learned is that conflict is normal, but especially when conflict is not handled well, it leads to deep hurt and pain and anger and bitterness. And really the only way out of that escape room, the only way out of the, the, the pain of anger and bitterness and hatred is leads through the door of forgiveness. And so uh, the New Testament talks about this a lot. For example, um, there in Ephesians chapter 4, this is one of the key relationship passages of the New Testament. We've looked at it several times in the series. You looked at it this week in your life group study. But Paul says that we need to get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to each other, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And so Paul, Paul assumes, as we saw last week, Paul assumes we're going to have conflict. That's normal. And he says, when it happens, your natural response and your old pattern is gonna be anger. It's gonna be bitterness. It's gonna be brawling. It's gonna be slander. This is what's come naturally. He says, followers of Jesus need to put off the old and put on the new. You're gonna put on the new of compassion and kindness, but especially learning to forgive. So if we want to grow, I want you to catch this. If we wanna grow up spiritually, you wanna become the person you're created to be, there is no substitute for learning how to let go and forgive. Um, when I was in, um, in my doctoral program at Fuller, I had the privilege of studying under Dr. Archibald Hart. And this week in your life group, um, it, you, if, if you're in there, you were doing this study, several quotes from a book that he, he wrote, one of the leading Christian counselors, psychologists of our nation. And he says, while there are many ways that we can deal with our anger, forgiveness holds the most promise for aiding us to effectively resolve our feelings of anger. No person is emotionally or spiritually mature who has not mastered the art of forgiving. How many of you, along with me, feel like you just took down a couple notches and became immature? Yeah, I've got my hand right up there. I'm still in that process. But what I want you to catch is that if we want to follow Jesus, if we want to be transformed, if we want to live the life we were called to, created to live, if we want to love others as he has loved us, the forgiveness is absolutely vital. Number two, not only is it vital that forgiveness is a non-negotiable. It's according to Jesus, if we're going to follow him, uh, unforgiveness or forgiveness is not the optional equipment on the spiritual life. You know, it's not like when you buy a car that you can say, you know what, give me this stripped down version. Uh, you can keep your GPS, you can keep your automatic driving. Um, I just want the basic uh, Jesus car. Uh, it's like, uh, I'm not, I don't wanna pay too much. I don't wanna do the high price. I wanna pay for all the extras. Keep your sunroof, keep your, uh, keep your navigational system, and keep your forgiveness. Uh, that for Jesus, he's super clear, and we've seen it in our life groups this week, that forgiveness is not optional. It is a non-negotiable. And we've seen it in many passages this week, Matthew 18, but one of my favorites is the simplest. It's the most familiar. It's in the Lord's Prayer. And you know how the Lord's Prayer goes? It says there on your note sheet, Matthew 6, towards the end, he says, forgive us our what? 
our debts as we forgive our debtors. And the most important word in that whole sentence is the word as. One writer has said it's one of the most scary words in the, in the English language. In this passage that what we're saying when we pray the Lord's Prayer is, Jesus, will you use me as a model? Will you forgive me in the same way that I forgive others? If you're not sure how to forgive me, Jesus, just watch me. And then you just kind of do what I do. Treat me like I treat others. And just in case we missed it, that little as, two verses later, Jesus says, he makes it crystal clear. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Now let me ask you something. Would you say that's fairly clear? Do you feel like you could ever stand before Jesus at the end of your life and you say, you know what, I just didn't get that. <laughs> I thought you meant in most situations. <laughs> but I thought if the hurt was bad enough, there was an exception clause. And you know, often as followers of Jesus, this is how we act. We say, oh, I'm all for forgiveness. We believe in forgiveness Except, unless it's an extreme situation. And then I reserve the right for an exception for these three people. Right? <laughs> Number three, forgiveness is canceling a debt. Now, what I want to do in this point is I want to talk about what forgiveness is and what it isn't. I think it's extremely important as followers. I think this often trips us up. We have misconceptions about what forgiveness is and isn't. So we're going to come back to what it is, this canceling of death. I want to start with what it isn't. There in your note sheet, I want to highlight three things that it isn't. Number one is that forgiveness is not forgetting. You know, oftentimes we think that to forgive is to forget. Sometimes this even happens with a biblical or theological basis, and the reason is there are several passages in the Bible, in fact, I, I gave you some examples there on your note sheet, references, where the Bible says that when God forgives us, catch us, he remembers our sin no more. And so when we read that, we think, well, if that's how God forgives, he doesn't even remember what I did, then that's what I need, that's what forgiveness is. But if you study those passages in context, it's not saying that God doesn't remember literally what happened. What he's saying is he doesn't hold you responsible or treat you as you deserve. And this becomes obvious because just think with me, the Bible is full of the record of sins, isn't it? Abraham sins, David sins, Peter sins, Moses' sins. And it's not like when we're praying, hey, God, would you forgive me like you forgive David? God's like going, what? What did David do? <laughs> well, you know, here in Psalm 51, you know, that whole thing with Uriah and that whole thing with like the murder and the Bathsheba. And remember the sex scene? <laughs> hmm, no, I don't remember that. I, I don't, it's just like, well, God, you need to read the Bible. I mean, it's just like, you know. So it's not forgetting. Number two, it's not minimizing or excusing. So often we, you know, I think this starts in childhood. Your brother hauls off and hits you in the mouth. And you go to your mom, mommy hit me in the mouth. And your mom says, well, I'm sure he didn't mean it. You just need to let it go. He's like, no, mom, he did. No, I'm sure that he was just swinging his arm, and you just happened to get your face in the way, you know? Uh, and so we sometimes grow up with the idea that forgive, and so we like, you need to forgive. Oh, no, they didn't mean it. Oh, I'm sure they didn't understand. And there are times when people truly have a reason or excuse, but if, if you know someone who sins again and there's an excuse, it's easy to let it go, isn't it? So forgiveness is not required when there's a reason or excuse. Forgiveness is about those times when it isn't. 
Like when Cain killed Abel, it wasn't an accident. It was premeditated, right? And so forgiveness is not about minimizing, it's not excusing, well, I'm sure he didn't understand, honey. No, he did. He understood. In fact, it's impossible to forgive an offense until we call it by its true name. You know, in our life, how does it work when you sin against God and you come to confess your sins? You have to call it by its true name. You can't pretend it's something that isn't. You can't pretend that it wasn't what you did or, oh, it's just a little mistake or a little oversight. No, you need to call it by its true name. And the same way, if we're going to forgive others, we have to call it by its true name. Otherwise, there's nothing to forgive. And so there on your note sheet, I love what Lewis says, C.S., uh, forgiving does not mean excusing. Many people seem, seem to think it does. They think if you ask them to forgive someone who has cheated or bullied them, you're trying to make out that there really was no cheating or bullying. But if that were so, there'd be nothing to forgive. Right? So forgiveness is not minimizing, it's not excusing. The third thing it's not is that forgiveness is not reconciling. So often we think that if I forgive someone, then the, the relationship has to go back to the way it was. And obviously, this is the goal. The goal is that we would forgive, there would be true reconciliation, and it could go back the way it was, or even stronger, but it's not always possible, is it? Sometimes, for example, you want to reconcile with someone, and they don't want to reconcile with you. Sometimes you want to reconcile with someone, but you don't even know where they are. They're no longer available. Maybe they're dead. Maybe they've moved, and you don't even know. They're not even part of your world. Uh, sometimes you want to reconcile with someone, but there's been a broken trust. So, for example, uh, maybe there's been sexual molestation of a child. There's been a rape. There's been financial fraud. So we can forgive someone, but it would not be wise to let that uncle continue to see your children, at least not alone. If you're being domestically abused in a family, you can forgive, but that doesn't mean that unless some changes happen, you go back into a violent situation. If someone has ripped off your company, your partner has ripped off your company, you can forgive them. It doesn't mean you can come back and put them over the finances again. Right? So forgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. So if, it's not, if, if forgiveness is not forgetting, if it's not minimizing or excusing, if it's not reconciling, what is it? And that's where we come back to our point that forgiveness is canceling a debt. So when someone sins against you, it's like they're in your debt, spiritually. Now, of course, this is the metaphor, the word picture that Jesus uses throughout his ministry about sin and forgiveness. We just saw it in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive, it, uh, uh, forgive me my, our, focus our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? That forgiveness is seen as a, an act of canceling a debt. The, for those of you who are in life group and you're doing your study this week, this was Matthew 18. Remember the king uh, in Matthew 18, the, the servant that comes before the king and he owes him this huge debt and the, the king cancels the debt. This is what forgiveness is. And, and part of then what forgiveness is when we cancel a debt, an important part of that is that we give up the right to hurt them back. And this is an extremely important part of understanding forgiveness. Anytime someone hurts you, injures you, betrays you, your natural response is going to be anger. And part of anger is a desire to hurt back. When I'm angry at you, I want to hurt you back for what you've done for me. So when I forgive, I am canceling a debt, and I'm giving up the right to make you pay by hurting you back. And so uh, there in your note sheet, I put a great quote by a friend of mine 
He was a counselor in the area where I used to live. And uh, he wrote an article one time that I thought he just did such a great job of summing this up. He says, in the Bible, to forgive literally means what? To let go. And that's true. In Greek, the most common word or the word that's often used by Jesus is aphiomi, which means to let go. And he says, so when someone commits a sin against another, they have committed an injustice against that person. Consequently, the offender has incurred a debt to the injured party. The New Testament defines forgiveness as letting go of that debt. In practical terms, forgiveness means deciding to let go of hurting back the person who has hurt you. Now catch this, very important. This is not a matter of good feelings or of of a particular state of mind. It's a decision I make. It's a choice. So we can make this, right? Like, let's say someone owed you, um, they owed you, uh, uh, you know, a large sum of money, and and there was a contract. You You could take that. It doesn't matter how you feel about that. You could take that and make that null and void, right? You could choose to do that. And so forgiveness is not about feelings. It's a decision to let someone off the hook. We'll come back to that later because that feels very unjust. We'll come back to it. But it's a decision to wipe the slate king clean. Remember in Matthew 18 when the, the king, um, the ser- he calls in the servant, owes him a billion dollars, and he says, don't, he says, don't uh, please have mercy on me. Don't sell me and my family into slavery. And the, the, the master chooses to cancel the debt. And so, uh, so forgiveness is about um, canceling a debt, giving up the right to hurt back. As, as Dallas Willard writes here, we forgive someone of a wrong they have done us when we decide that, they will not, we will, that we will not make them suffer for it in any way. Okay? Number four. Number four is that forgiveness is a process. So I want you to catch this. The decision to forgive someone and cancel their debt, that can happen in an instant, can it? That can happen in a moment. And we should make that decision as soon as possible. As soon as the injury happens before it festers and becomes a, a, like a cancer in us. So we should make that decision as soon as possible. But coming to a place of healing uh, is another matter. The decision to forgive can happen in a moment. But coming to a place of true peace where we're over the anger, we're over the desire to hurt back, that that is a process much like the healing of a wound. You know, when I was a boy, I was about in fifth grade, that I, I had a horrendous accident. I almost died. I was going down a, a really steep hill on a Stingray bike. I uh, had a pair of jeans on, no shirt. And I was going as fast as I could. It's a really super steep hill. And uh, all of a sudden, I began to experience high-speed wobble, which I didn't know that was a thing then. And uh, that's the last I remember. And uh, I went over the handlebars, five-point skull fracture, almost had to do brain surgery that night. My wife always says, think what you would have been. Um, <laughs> um, but I slid all down the hill, probably going 30, 30, 40 miles an hour on my back. The doctor said my head was like a basketball bouncing on the pavement. And uh, it took months to heal from those wounds. Um, and if you've ever had a bad injury like that, a bad wound, or it doesn't have to even be a bad one. It could just be you cut yourself with a knife, cooking, or something like that. But you know how this is, that when that wound first happens, those wounds were so tender to the touch. For months, I, I was there as my whole back was just scabs all over. I still have a scar on one of my shoulder because it was so deep. The scar tissue just built up to protect the body. And it was so sensitive to the touch. I remember my dad got a color TV. We didn't have one. It was like, I know some of you are like, man, you are old. You're so old. It's like, I feel like this is the history channel. um, And it had like the first remote control. And it was just awesome, you know? 
so you could watch any of the 10 stations. Um, <laughs> and he put, like a, he put like a white sheet on the sofa because my back was so raw to try to keep it from sticking. And you know, in the early days, the weeks of that, it was so tender to the touch. They had to keep me pretty medicated for a while. The pain was so severe. They put salt packs on the wounds to cleanse it. And they had to give me some pretty, and so at first it was so painful. But as time went on, it began to scab all over. And now you could begin to touch and it would be tender to the touch, but not super painful. But over time that heals, and all that's left is the scars, and you could touch it, it no longer hurts. This is how it works when we've been deeply hurt. That the decision to forgive can happen in an instant. To re- you can say, I, I choose not to hurt them back. I choose to cancel this debt. But in reality, that's not a decision we make once. It's a decision you have to make every time the memory returns and stings you again. And the deeper the hurt, the more times you have to let it go. So it's not really a decision we just make once, it's a decision we reaffirm over and over and over. And for some hurts, it may be a 1,000 or 20,000 times. But here's why I tell you, every time you say, I stand by my decision, I have forgiven that person, I have given up the right to hurt them back, every time, a little more scab, a little more healing until there comes a day when we remember the event but it's no longer sensitive to the touch. Number five. Number five is that forgiveness leads to freedom. So far we've talked about what forgiveness is and what it is and why it's so important for living a life of love and why it's a spiritual non-negotiable But you know, Jesus never tells us to do anything, and especially the hardest things, unless it will lead to freedom. I always put it this way, the Bible's teaching, the Bible's commands are always protective, they're never restrictive. Sometimes we see what the Bible says, like that feels restrictive. It's not restrictive, it's protective. And whenever Jesus tells us to do something, even the hardest things, the harder it is, the more important it is. It leads to life. And that's true of all teaching, but it's especially true, I think, about forgiveness. You know, when someone hurts us, we really only have two options. One option is to harbor that hurt, to hold on to that hurt, to become bitter and angry about that hurt, and to make the decision to retaliate, or the other is to let it go. But if we choose to hold on, it will destroy us. So one of the reasons why Jesus is so big on forgiveness, why it's so important, is not only because we need to forgive others because God has forgiven us, but because if we don't forgive, we become entrapped in a bondage of bitterness, and hatred, and anger, and our lives begin to revolve around that other person. There's an emotional link between us and them, and the deeper the hurt, the shorter the line. You know, we started the day with a story of this woman coming back to surprise her husband, and uh, this is a true story, um, I've added some details just to tell it. But it's a true story. It's a story that's told by Max Lucado in one of his books called The Applause of Heaven. And as you might guess, that when this woman opened the door, she found her husband in the act of making love to another woman. And if you've ever gone through something like that, if you've ever been cheated on, if you've ever been a cheater, or whatever, if this has ever happened to you, like you know the depth of that pain. And so our heart goes out to her, 
And we understand this tremendous temptation that she has to do what's natural to hold him accountable and make him pay. But what we just learned is that when someone hurts you, there are only two options. One is to retaliate and one is to cancel the debt. And if you retaliate, your life becomes stuck in the past. You can't move in the future God has for you. You are stuck in the past and your life and future is irretrievably tied to that person and to their sin against you. And so she decided that she was going to make him pay and he asked her to forgive him. He wanted to show good faith that he would be trustworthy, that she would have none of it. And years later, she wrote a letter to Max, the pastor Max, and she said, I caught my husband making love to another woman. He swore it would never happen again. He begged me to forgive him, but I could not. I would not. I was so bitter and so incapable of swallowing my pride that I could think of nothing but revenge. I was going to make him pay and make him pay dearly. I'd have my pound of flesh. So I filed for divorce even though my children begged me not to do so. And even after the divorce, my husband tried for two years to win me back. I refused to have anything to do with him. He had struck first. Now I was striking back. All I wanted was to make him pay. Finally, he gave up. He married a lovely young widow with a couple of small children. He began rebuilding his life without me. I see them occasionally. He looks so happy. They all do. And here I am, a lonely, old miserable woman who allowed her selfish pride and foolish stubbornness to ruin her life. And then Max writes, unfaithfulness is wrong. Revenge is bad. But the worst part of all is that without forgiveness, bitterness is all that's left. So forgiveness is the only way out that leads to life. There in your note sheet, a couple quotes, anonymous quote, forgiveness is setting a prisoner free and then discovering that prisoner was you. John Ortberg from this week, don't forgive and your anger will become your burden. Don't forgive and bit by bit, all the joy will be choked out of you. Don't forgive and you'll be unable to trust anyone again. Don't forgive, and the bitterness will crowd the compassion out of your heart slowly, utterly, and forever. And then Anne Lamont, not forgiving is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the rat to die. <laughs> Number six. Number six is forgiveness requires an act of faith. And this is so important that we understand this. You know, when someone sins against us, one of the reasons it's so hard to let them go is we have a tremendous sense of injustice. And as men and women created in the image of God, we long for justice. And so when someone sins against us, there's a sense that they have done wrong and they ought to pay. And we get that. And there's a greater sense, if I let them go, they're going to get away with it. And this is not right. And so it almost becomes like a moral imperative. This is where our, our, our pride and anger come in. I'm not going to let them get away with this. That would be wrong. The interesting thing is fallen human beings, have you ever noticed when someone else sins against us, we want them to get what they deserve. But when we sin, we want mercy. Like in the parable in Matthew 18 this week, when the servant who owes billions of dollars comes before the king, he begs for mercy. But as soon as he's forgiven, he goes out and someone who owes him thousands 
and says, now you give it to me now or you're going to prison. It's just something about our fallen human nature. We look at the sins of others through one end of the telescope and we flip it around to look at ours. And so to forgive someone, what we have to realize is theologically, biblically reality that we are not the boss of the world. We're not the center of the existence. We're not the center of the universe and we're not the boss of the world. And there is one judge, and he has promised, trust me, I will turn all things right. I will hold account. And he's the only one who has the wisdom to know how much mercy and how much punishment. And so forgiveness, we used the analogy earlier, forgiveness is canceling a debt. Well, here's another level of that. It's really turning, it's writing the debt off of our books and it's turning over to God as the ultimate collection agency to collect the debt in the right way at the right time, whether it's this life or the next. I love what uh, Philip Yancey, well, no, let's go to Romans 12 first. Romans 12, Paul says, do not repay anyone evil for evil he says, do not take what? Revenge. revenge. I'm going to hurt you back for what you did. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's what? Wrath. Wrath. Like he sees the evil. He hates the evil. He says, leave room. Like if you try to deal with it, God's going to say, great, you dealt with it. If you want to take care of it, I'll let you take care of it. If you want me to take care of it, I'll take care of it. So leave room. He says, For it is written, and he quotes from the Old Testament, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. So forgiveness is saying, I'm writing the debt off my books. God, I'm putting it on your books. I trust you to collect it at your perfect time. You're the only one who has the wisdom to know how to balance grace and mercy. Philip Yancey, in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, he says, in the final analysis, forgiveness is an act of faith. By forgiving another, I'm trusting that God is a better justice maker than I am. By forgiving, I release my own right to get even, and I leave all issues of fairness for God to work out. I leave in God's hands the scales that must balance justice and mercy. Isn't that good? Really good. Number seven, forgiveness is hard. (laughs) I saved the most obvious for last. Forgiveness is hard. So we've talked a lot about forgiveness. We talked about how it's vital to our relationships. We're going to love like Jesus. We talked about it's a spiritual non-negotiable. We've talked about what it is and what is it, how it leads to freedom. And it sounds so great until you have someone to forgive. And then it suddenly sounds really hard. In fact, impossible. Right? Uh, and I just want to affirm that, that when we talk about forgiveness, we, we are, we are, we're entering into ground. It's one of the most difficult spiritual challenges of life. But it's one of the most critical because we're going to be transformed to be like Jesus. Forgiveness is at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? Forgiveness is at the heart of the story. And if we be, want to be recreated to be like God, that this goes to the heart of the issue. So Elizabeth O'Connor, who's a famous Christian writer that you've probably never heard of, um, I love what she says, despite a hundred sermons on forgiveness, we do not forgive easily nor find ourselves easily forgiven. Forgiveness, we discover, is always harder than the sermons make it out to be. Can we have an amen to that? This sounds awesome on a Saturday night, beautiful day. Rain out, sun coming through, uh, and then someone cuts you off in the parking lot. And it's just like, it's all like, I'm going to tell them they're supposed to be a Christian. I can't believe that. They just heard that sermon and they did that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flash my brights on them and let them know in Jesus' name what I think of them. All right. All right. So it's harder than it looks. So Let's talk, let's get real practical now. Let's talk about how do we grow in this area. 
And uh, so there in your note sheets, the section uh, forgiveness, the steps of freedom. I've got three simple steps. The first one's going to take longer. The last two go faster. But um, the first one goes like this. We need to start this process. When someone offends us, we need to start the process with prayer. And I don't mean like a simple prayer. I don't mean like, uh, God, help me to forget. I, 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 uh, or even like, God, get them in Jesus' name. Uh, I, what I mean is that when someone has hurt us, we need to enter into a serious conversation with Jesus about the situation. And I'm going to break this down for you. So you may want to take some sub notes, like number some of these steps here, because we're going to cover a lot under this. So what I mean by ha- starting with prayer is, number one, we need to have a radically honest conversation with Jesus. Remember, radical honesty is always the first step to growth. And so it needs to start, we need to be radically honest about what they did and how we feel about it. It starts there. The second thing that we need to pray about as we're praying is we need to trace our anger to its source. We learned about that some this week in our life group, but you know, anger is a secondary emotion. A lot of you know that. It's a secondary. Anger is a sign that something else is going on. Like John said, it's like a smoke alarm, right? So anger, anger tells us that we've been hurt. Anger tells us that we've been frustrated. Angry tells us that our, anger tells us that our pride has been, we've been humiliated. Anger tells us we're afraid. It's a secondary emotion. And so one of the things we need to do as we pray and process this with Jesus is just to really seek him and to think this out and show, why am I mad and what is the sin? We need to trace down the anger. What, why am I so angry? What is it they did? After we trace it to its source, we need to name the offense. It's the third step. Name the offense. This is what they did. I'm no longer just have this, I'm angry. Like, well, what are you angry at? This is what they did. They betrayed me. They lied to me. They disappointed me. They ripped me off. They humiliated. What is it? We name name the the, the sin. Number four, and this is going to be a surprise to you, we need to confess our anger. This is critical. We will never learn to forgive while we are defending our anger. We will come back to this in a couple weeks, but just real quickly, there are three kinds of sin. Real quickly. Sins of commission, something I do that's wrong. Sins of omission, something I should do, but I don't. I'm not generous in it, whatever. And the third kind of sins, important here, the sins of reaction. When someone hurts me, that's a sin of commission. When I hurt them, say, I'm going to get that person back, that's a sin of reaction. Are you with me? You want that? And this is what happens. We get stuck here because we want to defend our anger and our desire to get them back. And we will never move in the freedom of forgiveness while we're defending our hatred with as righteous anger. It's righteous anger. I want to slug that guy. I want to key their car. I want to slice their tires. Um, I'm going to humiliate them. I'll wait for the right moment. And I have a right to feel this way because after what they did. As long as we defend our anger, we will never move forward. So we need to confess our anger. Then the fifth step is we need to ask for help. What we're doing requires the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not natural. What's natural is anger, what hatred, get them back. To truly forgive, we're going to need a work of the Holy Spirit. So we need to ask for help. And then after we've gone through that process that I just told you about, we need to, before Jesus, cancel the debt. I would suggest you write it down in a prominent place. You write it in your, that Jesus, I stand before you 
You know this. They've hurt me. My naturally, I want to take them out. I want to get them back. But I stand before you've forgiven me. I need to forgive them. And before you, I want to stop defending my anger and my hatred. I want to confess that is sin and it helped me to respond like you responded to me and before you and the angels of heaven. In your presence, I choose, not as a feeling, but I choose as an act of my will to let this go and I cancel this debt and I give up my right and I know this is gonna something I'm gonna do a million times, but here and today, I cancel the debt. That's what I mean by pray about it. Right. Number two. Number two, after we've done that, this is actually part of the process, but number two is pray for their best. One of the most practical ways that we can escape the, escape the prison of bitterness is to begin praying for their best. Remember what we learned back in week four that love is seeking the best of another person. And so this is not a matter of feeling. If I wait until I really want God to bless them, I'll be waiting a long time. This is an act of my will and something Jesus told us to do. There in your note sheet, Matthew 5, Jesus said, I tell you, love your enemies. We're going to talk about that more in two weeks. Love your enemies and pray for those who what? So this is, this is one of the most practical things you can do that I've found to do when someone's hurt you is to begin to pray for them. So here's what I mean. When we pray for our enemy or we pray for someone who's hurt us, what we are doing is we're standing with them in the presence of God and we're bringing them into the presence of God. And it's not a matter of feelings. It's a matter of saying, God, I bring this person before you. And you say, what do I pray for? Well, here's the sort of thing I'd pray for. God, I just bring them before you. I know you have a vision for their life. I know that you want to change them to be the person that you want them to be. And I want to stand with you, King Jesus, for your purposes in their life. And I pray that by your spirit you would draw them, that whatever is leading this behavior, you would reveal that to him. You give them the grace of repentance. You change them from the inside out. I pray that you bring a mighty work of repentance in their life. And I pray that they could become the kind of person that you're free to bless. We can, all, we can do this as an act of our will. So that's the second step. And the third step is we're going to practice doing good. Again, this is an act of our will, but when, we, when someone has hurt us, Jesus is very clear. In Luke chapter six, he says, love your enemies and do what? Do good to those who hate you. Now, you don't have to wait till you feel like this, but here's what I'd suggest is you come under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You've prayed this through. You've been honest. You've identified the sin. You've canceled the debt. You're beginning to pray for them. Don't be surprised if the Lord begins to put in your heart some kindness towards them. And I don't know what it would be. Maybe it's just, hey, you're inviting them to family dinner. They haven't been there forever. Maybe it's sending them a card. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know what it would be, but don't be surprised at the whole, and you may say, I do not want to do that for that person. <laughs> That's fine. You don't have to want to. I used to tell my kids this all the time. I don't want to do that. Hey, you don't have to want to. You just have to do it, right? <laughs> um, it's made them so mad. Um, <laughs> fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Um, <laughs> But this is, not a, this is not an issue of, oh, I just feel so warm and fuzzy towards it. No, this is an issue of just following what Jesus tells us. We're going to reach out. and We're going to do what he says. We're going to do good. And here's what we're going to find. Remember we saw in week four, C.S. Lewis said, when we, that as followers of Jesus, we're not called to feel our way into love. We're called to love people. Remember, love is more than a feeling. Love is an action. And remember what we learned is that as we take these steps to do the right thing, our feelings often follow. There in your note sheet, just a quick review of that. Remember what he said, uh, Lewis said, the rule for us as followers of Jesus is simple. Don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets that when, 
one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you'll presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you'll find yourself disliking them more. If you do him a good turn, you'll find yourself disliking him less. And so as Paul puts it in Romans 12, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? Good, yeah, right? And so we're going to come under the leadership of King Jesus. We're going to be radically honest with how we feel. We're going to name, we're going to trace our anger to its source. Once we find it, we're going to name it. And then we're going to come before Jesus and ask for his help to do what he's called us to do. And then in his presence, we are going to cancel the debt. Then we're going to begin to pray for this person, stand with them for God's redemption and work in their life to do for them what they may not be able to do for themselves at this point. And then as he leads us, we're going to do them good. And with each step of obedience, guess what? That wound that is so raw will begin to heal. And we will move into the future that God has for us free of the past with a new level of love and doing relationships a whole new way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time together. And Father, as we move into a time of communion now, as we come before you as a church and we come and receive the bread, the wine, we embrace your forgiveness for us purchased on the cross. Lord, we remember what you said, that our prayers, Father, would you forgive my debts as I have forgiven. And so, Lord, we don't want to ignore your word. We don't want to plead ignorance. We don't want to be a hypocrite. As we come to receive your forgiveness in communion, we come as humble and penitent sinners that recognize our debt that has been great has been forgiven. And so we come, Lord, to ask for your forgiveness for holding grudges, for defending anger. We come to repent of holding on to the sins of others and making them pay. And so as we come today, Lord, if there's someone in our life that we've been nursing a grudge, we've been holding on the past, we come today to confess our sins, to receive your forgiveness, and to cancel the debts of those who have sinned against us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to go into a time of communion now. And if you've never been here at Rocky Peak, let me explain how this is going to work. Around the room and at the top of the stadium seating, we have tables with the bread and the juice representing the wine Jesus used and representing his body, his bread, that, his, his body, his blood that was shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. It's why the Lord's prayer can work. And as we, we go in this time, we're going to be worshiping before the Lord and encourage you that you would go to the tables, find your space, don't feel, you know, feel free to find your place, and just to talk with Jesus about whatever he's stirring in your heart today. If there's someone in your life you need to cancel the debt, use this as a moment that you will not forget, this moment of communion you choose today to cancel that debt. If you've been guilty of harboring grudges and defending your anger, use this as a moment to confess that to Jesus and to be forgiven. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, what I would encourage you to do is either stay where you're seated or move around the room, find a quiet place to reflect on your spiritual journey and what you're learning. Maybe talk to God about what's happening in your heart. And communion is an act for believers in Jesus. It's, a soft, it's an act for those who have given their life, who have received his gift, his life. And so if you've not yet given that, it's like putting on a wedding ring if you're not married. You know, I, I just encourage you to find a place and spend some time with God reflecting. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you say, wow, I really want to be forgiven. I want to give my life to Jesus. 
then there's no better way to do that than to come and receive communion. And as you do, just ask Jesus into your life. Jesus, I receive your life, your death, your resurrection for me. Would you forgive me and come into my life? What a beautiful way to start your journey. And so as we go, the band's going to play. We're going to enter into worship. And let's go before the Lord as a church as we say together, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Amen? Amen. Amen.